our guests, events like this cannot happen without a community of supporters to get the job done. So I would like to begin by thanking the American Folklore Society for helping us bring our speaker to Bloomington today. My colleagues on the Floral Bloom series, Robin Dobler, Kennedy Johnson, and Jesse Riddle. Our incredible staff, Melissa Melhouse, Tabitha Rominger, Shelby Fleur, and especially Angus Burke for helping the Floral Bloom Committee attend to the details to pull off this event. And most importantly, I want to thank our guest for taking the time out of her busy schedule to make the trip back to IU. In fact, she was just in Columbus doing a gig there before coming here, by the way, to Chicago before she became to Apple. So Selena Morales is one of us. She completed her MA in folklore at Indiana University before joining the Philadelphia Folklore Project in 2010. And before that, as a student, Selena apprenticed under John Kay at Traditional Arts Indiana. Selena is the director at the Philadelphia Folklore Project and has applied the organization's mission and vision to develop innovative programming and the day-to-day -day operations that have to be done to keep a nonprofit group like this one doing great things for the Philadelphia community and beyond. At the Folklore Project, she has collaborated on groundbreaking initiatives such as Soul Songs Inspiring Women of Plasma, Honoring Ancestors, and an exhibition highlighting contributions of African and African American dancers and drummers. The Liberian Women's Chorus for Change, of which a documentary film was born called Because of the War. Now, the film project speaks to the potential for engagement with the arts, whether as creator, performer, or audience member, to move people towards positive action. Additionally, it speaks to the roles of folklorists like Selena and of the musicologist like Ruth Stone, who was the consulting scholar for the film, of the user-friendly, accessible work we do in ethnomusicology and folkloristics. Her newest initiative, La Ofrenda, Beauty Made Visible, is a project about Mexican-American home altars in Philadelphia's undocumented Mexican community. In her role as director, Selena has been invited to speak on social justice in folklore, public interest folklore theory and practice, Latino folklore, education, and urban folklore. Selena is a faculty member at Goucher, Goucher? Goucher. Goucher. Goucher College and their master's program in cultural sustainability, where she teaches a course on ethical and effective cultural partnerships. She's currently consulting on two national projects focused on addressing public folklore, infrastructure, and this nationwide. So won't you please help me welcome our guest, Selena Morales. your family or community. 
communities cultural health care. That is, what cultural practices, aesthetics, traditions do you use to keep one another well? Either when you were growing up today, sorry, growing up for today. What cultural antidotes or antitoxins do you rely upon when you're struggling? Take a minute now just to name, name it and think about its dimensions. How does this practice connect you to others? Connect you to time? To place? How does it connect you to the future? Hold these antidotes or your questions about your own antidotes in your mind as I share with you my examples today. And consider as I talk how you might make choices about using, sharing, growing, shaping, reshaping your own community wellness practices over time. In my home, we believe that dreaming is powerful. When you close your eyes at night, you may harness these transformational powers. If you dream with numbers, play the lottery. If you dream about a wedding, someone might die. If you dream a vivid dream whose images and wisdom you cannot escape when you awake, call Abuela. She'll interpret your dream and transform it into a message that will radicalize your everyday. Dreams are some of my family's tools for change. My abuela, my grandmother, Teresa Morales Diaz, is an Espiritista healer from Puerto Rico. The aesthetics of my grandmother's healing practice have always fascinated me. She's a community healer, and her dresser top altars are beautiful assemblages of carefully arranged objects, like pennies, dolls, candles, and flowers, which are juxtaposed with religious iconography that guard photos of my 21 cousins and me. They keep our planes on course, our heartache short, they fill us with power. I grew up in the Bronx learning about the world from behind the counter of my grandmother's botanica, a sort of spiritual pharmacy found in urban Latinx communities. In many ways, the objects she sold in her store were about transformation, and as a center of health and wellness in a low-income, mostly immigrant neighborhood of the South Bronx, her customers were in great need. She sold candles, incense, and potions, whose scent brought luck, love, money, or could chase away evil. She sold statues, rosaries, and other objects to help gather power on your altar. She also gave spiritual consultations. As a kid, I learned to experience scents and images as the aesthetics of wellness. This is my family folklore. This is my community cultural health care. This is us subverting the oppressive power structures of the government and privatized healthcare systems, creating our own ways forward, working within recognizable aesthetic systems to make wellness available to anyone. I evoke my history today to give you a sense of where I come from and to relate my expectations for caring for one's community and the power of aesthetics to how I choose to practice within folkloristics. How will we find our way forward through these very dark times? There are so many painful stories to tell about today. My response has been to grow and sharpen tools for advancing social, that is, community-based change. I see folkloristics, the theories, the practice, the study, the communicative acts as a valuable constellation for building collective power and action. What is the role of storytelling in any form in shaping our futures? Our ancestor, Dr. Catherine Morgan, a folklorist and the first African-American woman to join the faculty at Swarthmore College, described her great grandmother's stories of escaping enslavement as antidotes to, to racism. She chronicled these stories in a book, Children of Strangers. If my own children never intimately know the inside of the Volganica, how will they learn to become well? And how will they learn to expect or to play a role in making wellness in their communities without my grandmother's Volthanica in their mind. Our Volthanica has become a bedtime story. The bedtime story may become their touchstone. When I am an ancestor, what will they do with my story? We will all become ancestors someday, and what will be our legacy? How might you shape and reshape those wellness practices you thought of a moment ago? Will you innovate on your own traditions? Will you make the future possible for others? These are 
questions of community cultural health care. They are also questions of public interest to go In Emergent Strategies, Shift and Change, Changing Worlds, Adrian Marie Brown describes a world where we are responsible to one another, growing a movement out of love, out of, quote, a promise to honor one another's leadership, skills, knowledge, as we work together to build today's emergent strategies for survival. And I'll read that again. A promise to honor one another's leadership, skills, and knowledge as we work together to build today's emergent strategies for survival. Herein lie the methodologies I advocate for at the Philadelphia Folklore Project, and much more broadly as a folklorist working in my public's interest. Let me tell you a little bit about PFD and how some of these ideas play out in our initiatives. Since 1987, the Philadelphia Folklore Project has been dedicated to supporting and sustaining folk arts practice in Philadelphia. We work directly with traditional artists and community-based organizations who are using tools of social justice activism and community-based expressive culture to make change in their own communities. Partnerships and engagement of community members are at the core of our methods. We work in deep collaboration with individuals and communities in order to advance a collective vision for social change. For us, successful initiatives have transformative impacts on individuals who then have transformative impacts on their communities. Our work is often in collaboration with people who are directly impacted by institutionalized systemic oppression. World-renowned Liberian singers who have come to Philadelphia as immigrants and refugees to escape back-to-back -back civil wars. Exiled Tibetans who are using arts and culture to protest China's occupation of their homeland. Women artists whose work have been undervalued due to gender bias, and so many more have advanced their artistic practice and communities' cultural health as a result of working with PFP. We have prioritized and adopted a programmatic methodology that aims to recognize, that is, name and examine, and dismantle, that is, reject and counteract systemic harm. Our methods are formed by principles of collaborative ethnographic practice and a commitment to democratic participation and self-determination. Through our projects, with all of our communities, we ask, how do we remain accountable to these methods? How do we care for one another through this work? The threat of power imbalance is always looming and needs constant attention. Yet, as Adrian Murray Brown suggests, quote, each of us may lead in a way that shares and grows our strengths, that responds to our community's needs. That is, we fill in the gaps and grow together, end quote. What does it look like when we hold each other accountable to leading the way? I'll give you two examples of recent initiatives. At the Folklore Project, we create programs under this umbrella we call the Folk Art and Social Change Residencies. The idea here is that an artist or a community could be in residence with PFP staff, using all of our resources together to advance a folk art-centered social change initiative. <coughs> These projects range from a short year-long collaboration to multi-year, multi-faceted productions. I'll introduce you now to the, a performance-based project we're working on with members of the Liberian community in Philadelphia. Nine years ago, I sat at a table with Liberian storyteller Batu Kombe. He had been a participant in our community folk life documentation workshop. He had been trained by Guha Shankar and PFP's then director, Deborah Kodish to do ethnographic interviews with his community. He wanted to record Liberian proverbs and, fa and the fables that connected to them. He told me that the proverbs that he collected from elders in his community suggested that there was elder abuse within the community. He asked me, what can we do about it? I was new at my job, just out of grad school. I just moved from IU, and I had no idea. Batu and I discussed the proverbs and why he felt that they indirectly pointed him to this conclusion. I suggested he to speak with a pastor who hosted English and citizenship classes for elders in his church. A few months later, these comments, this conversation with Batu was still on our minds. We applied for and received a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to do field work within the Liberian community to learn more about what was going on. That was the purpose of our field work to learn about what it was to be Liberian in Philadelphia. We connected with Apple Shop, bringing in Dudley Cox to help facilitate this work. We invited Batu and three world-renowned Liberian artists with whom we had a relationship over the years, 
JTT, Formosa Bobo, and Fatu Gator. We talked with them about how we wanted to learn more about their communities. Fatu told them about his own Proverbs project and his conclusions. They all agreed to participate in being trained to interview their community and then to meet at PFP to debrief. While this ethnographic crew went out to gather the word on the street, to learn about what people had to say about being Liberian in Philadelphia, Deborah Kodish, Tony Shapiro, Kim, and I worked with Dudley to adapt the story circle methodology to be relevant to traditional performing arts. We thought about how these artists might best process what they were learning. We experimented with ways for telling and ways for listening. There were both blunders and breakthroughs in this process and the, as the artists came back into our galleries to report out and think about what they had learned. After a few months of gathering stories and sharing them back through song, dance, drama, and storytelling at PFP, the group decided that it was time to share the data, the data that they had gathered with Liberians. How do you listen to one another at home? We started with questions. We talked through how people listen in their homes, at church, after church, back in cities and villages in Liberia. We learned through those conversations that fable and proverb, indirect verbal arts, and dance drama would be the best way of hosting a sort of feedback session. Come on. There is a Liberian form for this. It's called palabra and we did what we could to create the conditions that would indicate to Liberians that this gathering might be collaborative like. Relying on the fame of the artists involved in the initiative, we spread the word about the show. About 100 Liberians gathered for our feedback show. The artists performed a dance drama about how to treat one another with kindness. The singers sang traditional songs embedded with values and morals. And finally, Batu, a storyteller, told a story about two jackals who, through mischief, ruined their community. Then he turned towards the audience and he said, who is your jackal? People stood up and gave testimony, one after another, mostly women, and we learned that intimate partner violence was a major issue on women's minds. Liberian women expressed that night that they needed support from one another. I'm fast forwarding now. But out of that event, we formed the Liberian Women's Chorus for Change, a group of superstar Philadelphia-based Liberian singers who perform traditional and newly composed music to instigate conversation about violence against women in the local Liberian community. I want to bring in some voices of people central to this project so that today's lecture can be multivocal. And so bear with me as I toggle through some video clips. First, we're going to listen to Fatu Gayflor, one of the founding members of the chorus, tell you about this process in her own words. The clip comes from a program that we presented about Liberian women as community resources. The audience included many Liberian high school students. And after the introduction that you'll see, our own Ruth Stone gives a beautiful lecture that includes insightful analysis of Liberian song. I encourage you to visit this at a later date. It's on YouTube. We went with our little video um, recorder. Some had tape recorder. We went from place to place. That was um, just to check and know how our people live in the community. But whenever I'm asking people why it was different from Liberia of, you know, maybe in Philadelphia, Africa, and we got all that and brought it back to our sponsor, the Philadelphia Football project we all live in. And then we decided to have a closing show. Doing the show, man, man, that's the time we really got what we want or what we didn't know. Everybody stood up and talked. We found out, oh, well, we were just chit-chatting around, but we found out that a lot of women got problems in Philadelphia. Our sisters are having problems, so how can we do it? So, well, we have the Mary, it's okay. And Fatu gave her that all the Liberians knew from my room. They know how to be fabulous singers and all of those things we did by them. So we just decided we can use our voices to reach our sisters. That's easy. We don't want to go around just taking a microphone. Hey, 
We are at your door. We heard your husband can get into trouble. We're coming to talk to you. No. We know it would not work. The only way we work was to sing those songs they heard before, to do those dances they saw before. Then they will open arms that we can be able to talk to them one on one. partnership, the Folklore Project staff and chorus members audited our skills and applied for funding again to support this super group to undertake a project that would bring traditional music that imparts ethics, morals, and values, and education about domestic violence directly to Liberian churches, community centers, and neighborhoods. Chorus members grew their leadership skills. You just saw Fatu in a public speaking role. That was just one of many, many opportunities that the chorus members had to step up as leaders in their community through this project. They grew their understanding of domestic violence and publicly committed to being a part of an informal support network of women within their communities. Together, we developed a repertoire. Together, we made budgetary decisions. Together, we pursued additional partnerships, kept one another accountable to shared goals, evaluated impact, and constantly revised our strategies. For us, this is what democratic arts work looks like. Listening well to one another and leading together is at the core. The chorus has been together and performing now for six years. They sing on main stages and in public libraries and in church basements. The project is directed by PFP's director of programs, Dr. Tony Shapiro Kim. In the next clip, Tony will tell you more about Liberian song and introduce you to some of the brilliance of each of the chorus members. The video is very dark. She's speaking from a stage at the start of a concert at World Cafe Live in Philadelphia. My name is Tony Shapiro Kim. I'm director of programs at the Philadelphia Folklore Project. And for being here. We're really honored to have you with us tonight, and we're so honored to be working with absolutely fabulous artists. Um, next up is the Liberian Women's Chorus for Change. The chorus formed a couple of years ago after Liberian immigrant artists identified issues within their own Philadelphia communities that they wanted to address through song. Specifically, they chose to offer avenues for people to start paying public attention to domestic violence. They've been doing this through song and drama, starting dialogues about what abuse looks like. It's not just physical, it can be psychological, it can be financial. They've been doing this by starting dialogues about what the laws are that can protect us and how to get help from resources that people might not have known were right here. Relating music, singing, and drama to contemporary concerns was nothing new for any of the women in the chorus. Liberian songs often carry a principled or ethical potency. Through parables, the posing of questions, and even through humor, they encourage reflection about one's life and about choices about how to live. Fatu Gayflor and Zaytiti, two of the women in the chorus, um, they have been lead singers in Liberia's premier performing arts troupe and superstar recording artists back home in Liberia. They spent the years during which Liberia was engulfed in civil war in a number of refugee camps in neighboring West African countries. While there, they individually, separately, performed for fellow refugees, both to offer hope and to inspire the imagining of a different way to live, that is, without the violence plaguing their country. Meanwhile, Marie Yenabo and Toki Toma, two other women in the chorus, chose to stay inside Liberia during the years of war. They met up for the first time while each was striving to use her art for peace building and reconciliation work. Marie is ethnic Krom, Toke is ethnic Gyo, and these were two of the ethnic groups pitted against each other during the war. They literally risked their lives to travel together to contested territory, performing as a way of demonstrating an alternative to the hate and distrust. They were able to be together on stage. They performed for soldiers, asking them to put down their weapons. And they were so famous that it's as if Beyonce and let's say Adele showed up, you know, at your encampment, 
sang a song that you, that you loved and then said, by the way, you know, hand me your gun. And the child soldiers actually handed over their weapons. So in Liberia and in the refugee camps, their song and their singing worked alongside official peace negotiations. So nobody was thinking that, oh, you sing a song and the war ends. Um, it was integrated into the peace process. Indeed, one of Toke's compositions became the theme song of the Liberian Women's Peace Movement, and the leader of that movement, Lema Bowie, won the Nobel Peace Prize. And one of Marie's songs, which is the third one on the program tonight, called Tua, T-U-R, um, became central in that movement's messaging about forgiveness and the accepting back home of people who had, in many cases, been forced to commit terrible crimes against their own loved ones, their own families, their own neighbors. Here in Philadelphia, their songs and their performances and discussions also do not exist in isolation. They are supported by relationships with the local organization Women Against Abuse, a fabulous advocacy and education group and with Liberian organizations as well. These relationships give them a platform upon which to reflect on their community's history and current circumstances, and to inspire the imagining of the kind of future they want here for Liberians. Then, together with their audiences of Liberians, young and old, male and female, they can take first steps towards realizing those dreams. I mentioned that Liberian songs often have a kind of moral weight they are also an amazing source of entertainment and fun, and that's what uh, tonight's focus is. That's what tonight's focus is. Um, you know, here uh, in the audience, you're being joined by people watching all over the world. Uh, world Cafe Live is live streaming this at the moment, and we sent out a link to the live stream over Facebook, and there are almost 30,000 people who clicked on it. Uh, and many of the people watching uh, at this moment are in Liberia. So on the count of three, I'd love us all to give a shout out to them by saying, hello, Liberia. So would you do that with me? Okay. One, two, three. Hello, Liberia. So let's listen to their music. Um, this song is called Leoyo and it's led and arranged by Zay Titi in the Don language. And because of time, I won't play the whole song, but I want you to just have um, their voices in your mind. <laughs>
these clips were taken from that all that same concert, World Cafe Live, and they had like four or five different cameras on them, and sometimes the microphones are a little off. So if we can't hear what she's saying at first, I'll just paraphrase it for you. Okay, our next song is called Our next song is called Odigi. It's a song from the Loma Tribe. It's about two sisters. They've gone to the farm. The big sister cannot find the little one. And she calls the girl across the farm. Tonight we are not here on the farm. We are not, you know, in Liberia on the farm, but we are here at a work cafe playing live and asking all of you sisters and around the world to join us, not to walk, keep what? Silent. Speak up. When you have been beaten by your husband or your girlfriend, your boyfriend, please speak out. Yep. We're not just calling our sister not to leave the farm. We are calling onto all sisters that have a problem. Not keeping it in, to put it out. It will stay with you tomorrow. The story of the chorus was featured on our local national public radio station as part of a pub popular calling news program, Radio Times, that focuses on important civic and cultural issues in the Delaware Valley. They dedicated 45 minutes of this hour-long show to talking with Fatu and Tony about the work of the chorus. At the end of the show, the call-ins that were aired were mostly Liberian listeners who shared emotional appreciations of Fatu's music and lifelong dedication to the upliftment of Liberians. I'll play one for you. To go and, and to perform. Let me see what uh, Lishan uh, has to say. Lishan from uh, Delaware. Go ahead, you're on Radio Times. Hi, I just want to say thank you, Fatu Giver. Uh, I'm so overwhelmed right now. I don't know what to do because I was a little girl. I remember I used to go to the Providence Island. We used to go to the island yes. and go watch you dance and sing. And oh my God, you are beautiful, Akra. And you. you're doing a great job. I was in the war in my area, so I know the experience. And I was nine years old when I was in the war in my area. I've seen killing, oh. you know? So I just want to say thank you for everything you're doing for the Liberian women. You know, for all the frustration and the hurt that we've been going through. I just want to say thank you, man. Thank you very much for everything you've done. And you are a queen. Thank you. Oh, thank you so, so much. Thank you for calling. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I have to say, there's some hankies being passed around here in, in the studio. And, you know, who could uh, imagine not being moved by a call like that? And it touches on so many different things, Tony, about just the, you know, obviously the pain of, of the war, the pain of immigration. Even if you come to what you might consider a better future for yourself, there's still things that you leave behind. You know, yes. memories, people, things, all of that. Right. And uh, sometimes the um, engagement with these traditional community-based arts helps um, to tie people back together, uh, helps to connect people with those memories and with one another to recreate community in a new place in really constructive ways. You have I want to emphasize what Tony noted here, the power of traditional arts to help reconstruct community, dignity, and identity, particularly in immigrant contexts. This is why I'm labeling these arts as antidotes, and why I point to thriving traditional arts as important ingredients in community wellness efforts. I also <coughs> want to put out, point out how the Folklore Project is at work, behind the scenes and through a variety of layered intentions in the materials that you've just seen. For about three years, with funding from the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage and the National Endowment for the Arts, 
We supported chorus members. That is, we paid them to rehearse every Friday for two years, a salary. We also paid them to perform around the Philadelphia region. We leveraged PFP's connections to media, to venues, to technology, to get their work in front of new Liberian audiences. This radio program, for example, broadcast to hundreds of thousands of everyday listeners in the Delaware Valley, raises awareness about the nearly 15,000 Liberians living in the region. It introduced this world-renowned artist living locally to her wider community. It brought the work of the chorus and women against abuse into conversation with other pressing issues in the region. It provided Liberian content for the first time in its 36 years on air. The impact of hearing your own stories told in mainstream media is not lost on us. You also heard Tony continue to highlight the importance of these art forms in local communities. Many of our efforts were like this, multi-layered with impacts that are at once tangible and immediate, like Fatu receiving recognition and praise from Liberians right then and there, Fatu having another opportunity to publicly articulate her story, PFP's work being more widely known, and they're also intangible and maybe long-term. One caller in reported that a song he heard that day during the program was the song playing on the radio when he fled Monrovia during the war. We don't know how hearing that song again impacted him, but we are sure that it did. There are so many stories to tell about this particular initiative. The time we learned that a group of young women in Nimba County, Liberia, invited Toke Toma and Zaytiti to visit because they wanted to emulate the chorus in their own community. Or the time after a performance when an audience member told Fatu Gayflor that when she was younger and experiencing depression, the only thing that helped was listening to Fatu's traditional music. She said, quote, I didn't need therapy, I needed you, end quote. Or the time after another performance when a woman spoke up and revealed that this was the second time that she had seen the group. The first time she sat speechless during the post-concert Q&A. She was stunned by the music and the messaging. Nonetheless, she went home and created an online forum for Liberian women of her particular ethnic group so that they could check in with one another. Chorus members, as a direct result of working on this project, were poised to apply to prestigious awards for their art, three of them receiving Pew Fellowships in the Arts and each of them winning, winning a Leeway Foundation Transformation Award. Each of these awards carried a life-changing amount of money for, as prizes. Houses were bought, immigration legal fees paid, trips to Liberia to visit parents were booked. There are many stories that we've heard and there are many that we will never know. We don't know what in the long run it will mean that PFP poured so many resources into lifting up the role of these four women in their community, that we worked with them to identify this issue, that we applied with them for funding to support their choice of using song to address domestic violence, that we created a structure for our initiative that allowed each of us to bring our talents and expertise to work and take on a leadership role side by side, or that we have all committed to each other personally and professionally for the long haul. I have watched each of these four singers in this group transform. They have always been leaders and have found ways to harness their powers in their new home. And the work continues. Last year we released a documentary film because of the war about the women in the chorus and how each of them have used their music to address injustice and inspire action for social change. By telling the stories of Fatou, Marie, Zé, and Toke through film, we aim to link Liberians of all generations and the general public with some of the most renowned traditional Liberian singers and dancers in order to deepen understandings of active, constructive roles the arts and artists can play in moments of crisis in the lives of families and communities. Since its release, we've hosted screenings and talkback sessions and concerts for Liberians and on college campuses and public libraries in our region and beyond. The film has screened internationally in Indonesia, India, Cambodia, and Zimbabwe. We've traveled to university campuses for week-long residencies about refugees, peace building, and the arts. Two days ago, it screened at Ohio State University's Center for Folklore Studies, and earlier this week at the University of Pennsylvania's Conference on Arts and Trauma. The film promises new kinds of impacts for PFP and for the field of folklore as we make plans to screen it for police officers who patrol southwest Philadelphia 
an area where the majority of Philadelphia's Liberian community lives, and also, of course, to bring the film to Monrovia, Liberia, someday soon. I'll play for you now the trailer for the film. So they're getting afraid from one another. Because of all the war, other people who hate other people, other people who hate other tribe. We were all in the dormitory and all of a sudden we were going shooting and we didn't know where to go. This is a responsibility that I'm about to take. It's not just thinking, but I'm going to pass messages over to people who are very bitter. What can I do to make them to, to turn sweet?
the expected community know itself more deeply. Most often our interpretation work is for the communities themselves rather than thinking about like general public as an audience. From the start, it was clear though that TAP's intention was int to introduce themselves and the situation of their homeland being illegally occupied by China to non-Tibetan Philadelphians. Um, and then while I tell you the rest of this story, I'm gonna just play a slideshow. Tony Shapiro Kim began conducting what turned out to be 18 months of ethnographic research. She followed the community around through their calendar of events, weekly language and art school for, for kids, monthly gatherings to non-violently protest China's occupation of Tibet and cultural genocide waged against Tibetans living within the region, and annual celebrations both Tibetan holiday of both Tibetan holidays and American holidays. The photographs you see now are taken from her field work. She interviewed community members at each of these events, learning more especially about their commitment to what they call their Tibetanness and what we might call Tibetan folk life, ways of being and knowing and expressing that have been outlawed back home, leading to conversations about the meaning of cultural freedom. As we felt, after we felt the field work was enough, we hosted a big meeting at the Philadelphia Folklore Project's gallery, again asking ourselves and the TAP leadership how we might gather in a way that feels authentic to this community and that might encourage sharing and openness. By being close and listening carefully to the community, we learned that on the last Wednesday of every month, Tibetans locally gather for a locker celebration. They wear Tibetan clothes, speak Tibetan language, eat Tibetan foods, and engage in programs that support the upliftment of Tibetans. Tibetans worldwide do this on Wednesdays, the Dalai Lama's holy, holy day, and in Philadelphia, they gathered just once a month. We hosted a locker event in our gallery, and this was one over, of many over the years. To, to prepare, we selected about 50 of these best photographs from our collection and hung multiple copies of each around the gallery, literally on a clothesline with clothespins. When community members arrived for the evening's program, they were asked to tour the photographs and select one that they loved. After folks ate a meal and finished making their selections, we offered the opportunity to meet with Tony and me privately to tell the story about the photograph that they selected. We've tried this methodology many times with different communities, and usually um, we have people publicly share their feedback because one of the wonderful impacts of that kind of program is that it helps the fortify the community. People hear one another's stories, you see agreement or discord, and it's a really, it, for us, it's been a very beautiful event. But we knew from being with this community for so long that people would not want to share their stories publicly. So we offered these private sessions that often also included an interpreter. Oh, I went off script. Um, the, text, <laughs> the text that we gathered that night became the exhibit text that accompanied Tony's pictures in our 2015-16 <coughs> exhibition entitled Tibetans in Philadelphia, curated by myself, Tony and the board of the Tibetan Association of Philadelphia. On the sixth anniversary of Lo Song's residency, his mandala making took place in our gallery within the context of an exhibit that explored the annual, monthly, weekly, and daily rituals that Tibetans engage in in order to assert their Tibetanness. This exhibit stayed in our gallery for almost two years, and during that time, TAP Arts and Culture School used our gallery for its Sunday classes for Tibetan youth. While the exhibit was up, we continued to support the community by helping them apply for apprenticeship grants to learn Tibetan musical instruments, expand TAP by receiving grant funding, grant funding from local foundations, programming Tibetan-centered arts workshops and a film screening, and providing the group with access to our gallery space whenever they wanted it. Lo Song Samten does a residency at both our gallery and at the elementary school that we helped to found called the Folk Art Culture Treasures Charter School, known as FACTS. This K-8 public charter is dedicated to using folk art and social justice curriculum to foster the expectation among its mostly immigrant and refugee students 
to become actors in a more just world. Annually, Lo Song spends a week creating and dismantling a mandala at Facts 2. K to 8 students visit him to observe his progress and learn a little bit from the former Buddhist monk. Around the time that this exhibition was being installed in the gallery, gallery we recognized that both Lo Song and the teachers in the school were experiencing fatigue with his visits. While we thought it was great that the students had the chance to visit with him every single year for nine years, it needed more attention. Because of our new and deep knowledge of the local community and of our, the San Mandela tradition, we gathered a group of teachers from Bax to work alongside Lo Song to bring a multi-year spiraling curriculum that would engage students in three-year cycles through, through their tenure at Bax. So for example, kindergartners would learn about the art form and then go visit the mandala. And first graders would have the next lesson, it would be about the artist, and then they would go and have an interview with Lo Song. And then in, third, in second grade, they would learn about the context of the art form and the artist. Um, whether that was, depends on how old they were, whether that was Philadelphia or back in Tibet. Then in third grade, again, they would start with the artist and learn something a little bit more as they had matured. So this would spiral all the way up to eighth grade. Each lesson, some of which included interviewing and developing interview skills, um, could be delivered by either a classroom teacher or by the artist himself. This curriculum and its teacher guide include a lesson centered on our Tibetan and Philadelphia exhibition for the eighth graders. The curriculum is a promising model for replacing the standard school-wide assembly, replacing a one-week art infusion with a nine-week-long curriculum spread out over nine years, focused on one art form and one artist. We've made this available on our website, and the materials are revised constantly as teachers use the lessons and refine them in practice. The effort was led by PFP's then education specialist, Linda Deffenbaugh, she is now on staff at FACTS, and her work at the school is often written about in the Local Learning Network's Journal of Folk Arts and Education, in case folks are interested to learn more. Let us return to antidotes and folk songs now. In his documentary, Tibet in Song, ethnomusicologist Nalong Shofel highlights the brilliant and beautiful endangered folk songs of Tibetan people. These folk songs which, for example, hold the details of how to root the house how to treat your mother, how to be Tibetan, were targeted by the Chinese government. In many cases, they were replaced by musical communist propaganda and nearly forgotten. Nawang's work is concrete evidence of the power of folklore forms. Some of you may remember when Nawang was collecting folk songs in Tibet as part of his dissertation research, and he was jailed for six and a half years, and many of his recordings were destroyed. It is a miracle that this film exists. The film documents this cultural disruption from 1995, but today in Philadelphia, I am seeing the impacts of this erasure of culture as I work with local Tibetans to piece together cultural practices. They ask the very questions that I ask myself. If my own children never hear our songs about wellness, how will they learn to become well? And how will they learn to expect to play a role in making wellness in their communities? We'll be okay. People who raise families far from home create something new to teach something old and vice versa. This is human ritual. Nonetheless, the age-old impacts of migration need daily attention, and we should work together to support one another. That is why I'm asking you, what is your DAO? And what is your cultural antitoxin? How will you know how to root a house, to nurse your cold? What will keep you hopeful during the age of Trump? Who will you teach? Are you thinking about the future? We study folklore, document, interpret, present, archive. We live folklore. Public interest folklore works from a principle that we are all in community together, that we are responsible to one another, and that we can take action that allows us to lead together, to strive for peace, dignity, and safety in our communities. The Philadelphia Folklore Project is not a wellness center although it may be the closest I'll ever get to having my own Volcanica. Yet, we know that many dimensions of our work make people well. Our core methodology is to create the conditions by which we can lead, side by side, advancing community-based traditional arts in the service of social justice.
lot. So we know, and at this time, I think we can open the floor to some questions from the audience. Hi, I'm Candy. I sent you Kennedy. Okay. Yes. Um, I was glad to meet you. Nice to meet you. So two things. One's just like, first of all, I really enjoyed your talk. It was really inspiring. Uh, but the first thing, I really like your idea of community cultural health care. So this is more of a comment. But um, so like I work with like this idea of trauma and mm healing -hmm. in urban spaces um, and then like how we can heal in the classroom using music. So like I like that. Anyway, um, so my question is can you speak more about the folk, folk arts cultural treasure charter school? Because that sounds really dope. Um, and my background's in music education. Um, and I still work with kids, and I like being able to teach them about folklore and music um, in, a, in a non reductive way, and that's what this sounds like it's doing. It sounds really um, I can speak more about the, the school. I could speak for hours about the school. Um, my children attend the school, and I'm the president of the board of directors, so I have a lot of different kinds of perspectives to offer. I've also worked there in the, in the capacity um, when I was a I've had some other title of the book project. Uh, program something, I think. Um, so the school, but I'll just give you briefly. The school um, was founded by the Philadelphia Folklore Project and another uh, activist organization called Asian Americans United. Um, and it is the only public space in Chinatown, um, in the city center in Philadelphia. And uh, the school basically utilizes folk and traditional arts and social justice to um, kind of set the tone and the community of the school. So, for example, there's a ritual calendar in the school. Um, one event on the ritual calendar, as an example, is Many Points of View Day, which replaces Columbus Day. And on that day, the students learn about multiple points of view um, and how to think about the Columbus story. Um, another example is there's Honor Your Elders Day, where everyone in the school all day long is engaged in a conversation about the role of elders in their lives. And of course, what that looks like for kindergartners is different than what it looks like for middle schoolers. Um, so in addition to the ritual calendar, there's also um, ensembles. It's from third until eighth grade, every student has the opportunity to select to become part of an ensemble. And the ensembles are once a week for the entire school year for six years. And so, for third until eighth grade. So the ensemble, for example, the choices that they have are step, um, African diaspora drumming, um, Don Chan, uh, Vietnamese Don Chan, uh, Chinese opera, uh, Indonesian dance, There's one more I'm forgetting. And then in addition to that, every year the students have an artist in residence that comes into their classroom and spends um, a number of weeks, it could be, like Lo Song, he's there just for a week, but he's there for nine years of their lives. Or there's um, Day of the Dead Arts that corresponds with the, with the art class. Um, but then there's things like, um, in English language arts, gym and, and art, they have Chinese shadow puppet. Um, and so in, in gym class, they learn how to move like the animals that they'll be in the performance that they'll do at the end. They're not all performance related, but in this one happens to be. English language arts, they learn the story of the monkey king, which is the story that they'll interpret and retell um, during the performance again. In art class, they make masks that will then be projected um, during that. So those are some of the art you know, interventions that are just built into the DNA of the school. And in addition, there's a folk arts committee at the school, which is made up of folklorists, um, individuals from Asian Americans United, who see the role of folk and traditional arts in their activism and organizing. They're really allies to our organization, as well as teachers in the school who kind of steward the folk arts program. And so one example would be a couple years ago, a lot more Indonesians um, arrived to Philadelphia and a lot more Indonesians started coming back. And we noticed we didn't have any Indonesian arts. So our job is to kind of be responsive to the community and say, all right, time for the folklore project to go out and do some field work to learn more about what kinds of arts are being practiced in the Indonesian community, determine if there are any potential teaching artists there. Linda Deffenbach, who was on my staff and is now on the staff of the, of the back school, is an evaluation specialist and a teacher trainer. And one of the things that she does is she trains traditional artists to teach in the classroom to individuals who are not co-cultural with them. So they may be expert teachers.
teachers, and they're certainly leaders in their community, that's one of the criteria for selecting them as a teaching artist. But they may never have thought about, well, what happens when you're teaching someone who doesn't really know the starting point? Where is that starting point? How do we identify it? How do we teach it? How do we break it down into a lesson that we can evaluate? So there's someone in the school to train the artist to think about how traditional arts might, um, dare I say, be authentic <laughs> in some way um, in, the, in the classroom. So that's just like a little snapshot of facts. second question is, uh, you're coming from our program, and I'm interested in what's been the most effective in terms of what you gained here at IU in your work, and what might you have wanted to learn uh, that would have helped your work at TFP? Okay. Um, so, uh, around our funding structure, so we, we're an independent nonprofit. We have, we're not, we don't work in, and we work in partnership with facts, but we don't have a university or a um, government structure connected to, to our governance in any way. Um, so we're beholden to our board. Um, our mission is to work in the <coughs> social justice and folk arts. Um, so we're very explicit with that and we're extremely mission driven. Everything that we do has, has this intersection. Um, we don't really deviate from it very often, although there are some exceptions. Um, we, our, our funding is made up of, you know, the, the percentages have shifted so much recently with just the change of money. Um, but we have, I mean, I'll give you some numbers. We have between, any year, our budget fluctuates between three hundred and five hundred thousand dollars um, And that's with staff staying the same. So it just really has to do with how much programming that we're doing. If we're making a film, for example, our budget might be much higher, or we're sponsoring the chorus or this recent um, Klezmer project and this Mexican um, field work and altar project that we've been doing have been very expensive. Um, and then in terms of what money comes from where for those budgets, um, government funding, that's city, state, um, so the arts councils, um, the, the city council, the, art, the arts councils, and the National Endowment for the Arts, I would say give us about maybe $100,000 out of that 300 to 500. And the, really the rest of it is local foundations in Philadelphia who love us because we are working with immigrant and refugee communities we are bringing dollars to arts that are often under overlooked um, and underfunded, um, and we are doing it in a way that is ethical and that they get feedback from other communities that they appreciate. So we have a, you know, Deborah Coach ran the organization for 27 years and really established a beautiful, amazing, very strong reputation for us. And so we ride that pretty far in terms of the funding um, in Philly. A very, very small percentage comes from individual giving um, and from contract work. So the Folk Art Culture Treasure Charter School pays us to administer the folk arts programs over there, although that's shifting a little bit. We're really nimble. Um, we can basically do whatever we want whenever we want, as long as we have the funding for it and the board agrees. Um, so our projects change. Sometimes we've got like five things going on at once, and other years we're hyper focused on one thing. Does that answer that part of your question? Um, I have grown a lot as a practitioner and as a scholar um, since leaving IU. Uh, in the last nine years, I've you know it's just been amazing to be able to be out working, and so I've I've grown and learned a ton. And I think, except for one thing. <laughs> I really had everything that I needed to start this job nine years ago when I left IU. Um, the one thing is, is that I don't think I was aware enough about the way evaluation can impact the growth of a program. Um, and, you know, I think that just was like a happenstance kind of thing. But in terms of like the kinds of coursework I took, um, the kinds of, you know, work study, 
study choices that I made, um, the kinds of assistantships, I think that's what they're called, that I had, like they all really prepared me to start in at the you know, more entry level at the folklore project, and then of course I grew from there. Yeah. But I, I, mean, I can tell you specifically later if you'd like about what, what my coursework was like and what choices I made while I was here, which I think made a big impact. Yeah. And no one gave me to that. <laughs> I had great mentors. I had great mentors, yeah. I wanted to ask you a question about the librarian women. Um, in the outward facing parts of their uh, presentation, I'm curious about whether their focus on domestic abuse um, further stigmatized them or whether about it further stigmatizing them as a um, an already because of Ebola already stigmatized immigrant group. Yeah, that, thanks for asking that good question. Um, so it was complicated. So I guess I'll answer it first, like within the context of the Liberian community, which is huge and has its own kind of networks and what's public and what's publicity within their community. There was a lot of pushback from men, first of all, and like really powerful men. Um, saying, whoa, this isn't a problem here, right? So um, we had a, one program where the um, women did a pop-up performance right outside of a grocery store where a lot of Liberians shop down, like way in the southeast, uh, west of the city in a park. And um, they just, you know, imagine Beyonce setting up in a park and just being like, oh, I'm sitting right here, come on by. So it was really exciting. And um, WHYY, the local NPR station, came and uh, wanted to do some interview and learn more, and they were interviewing women against abuse. And one of the leaders of Liberian community, who's a very public person in the city, came to the performance, and she asked to interview him. And then on the radio, he said, there's no problem with domestic violence in our community. I don't know what they're talking about. And then she aired it. <laughs> um, so that, you know, that was that's just one layer. Um, the other thing is, is that the women were trained, uh, they went through several trainings by Women Against Abuse to learn how to talk about domestic violence and actually to like expand their understanding of what domestic violence, intimate partner violence is. And so they really had a very strong script where they were not assigning this as a problem to the Liberian community. And it, not in the clips that I showed, but actually in the film, you see Fatu speaking up and saying, women everywhere have this problem. This is a problem in all of our communities, and we're making the choice to address it in ours. And we encourage everyone here, she was speaking to a group of non-Liberians, to think about how you might make your community better. And they were really on point with that message. So that was another way. But we did think about and worry about that a lot. Um, and it, it just kind of, I don't know whether it was kind of, some of it was planful and intentional, and some of it was just, it never happened. It never got turned into a story about this negative thing happening for Liberians. Maybe it wasn't that important to the news.
it's not Chinese people that is the issue, it's the government's policies. Um, and so being careful about language. Um, low so uh, the Folk Art Culture Treasure, uh, Charter School is in Chinatown, and 70% of the students are Chinese immigrants. And Lo Song were very intentional about bringing him into that school so that these Chinese individuals meet a Tibetan person and learn about the distinct Tibetan culture. And that's, you know, a teacher making friends with a student, right? So when Lo Song walks through Chinatown, kids come running out of their, their parents' groceries and say, like, Teacher Lo Song, Teacher Lo Song, you know? And how amazing that they're calling this individual a teacher in their lives, and he's teaching them Tibetan art. So there's this, like, that good layer that isn't about conflict or, or problems. Um, when we were learning about the Tibetan community, they have a, a folklore dance group. Um, and every year in Chinatown, Asian Americans United are very trusted partners who are activists and kind of like have their heads on their shoulders the way we do. Um, they put on this amazing, really tra community transformative festival called the Mid-Autumn Festival. Um, and I could go into the whole history of why it's amazing, but I'm gonna just say it's a great festival. And the then director of AAU noticed that we were getting closer with the Tibetan community. He said, how would the Tibetans like to perform at our festival? We think it would be great. That's a great idea. She's like, I'll put you in touch with the volunteer who's running the stages. So I talked with the Tibetan Association. I said, you know, part of what they were really interested in doing when they were in our gallery in the first place was to have some kind of dialogue with Chinese people to, like, meet them. You know, most of the Tibetans living in Philly are coming from Dharasala, India. So the, the China context is completely foreign to them, other, like the people of China, other than feeling like something was very stolen from, very much stolen from them, you know? Um, I'm simplifying things. But, so I talked to the TAP board and said, you know, how would you like, how would you like to do this performance? And said, that would be great. That way, the Chinese people will see us and they'll see our culture is exactly what we want to do. So about two days before the performance, they called me and they said, we just received the program. And it says, Chinese ethnic minority dance. <laughs> We're not going. And I'm like, great, do not go. <laughs> and I made some phone calls and, um, you know, that was just the way that that individual programmer interpreted it and it became an issue for that other community and there was a lot of mediation and conversation and we connected the TAC board to the Asian Americans United board so that they could talk and kind of figure it out. But that's just like one example of it was like, thank goodness people trusted us to check in. Sure. Because if they hadn't, then they would have been on stage kind of reifying an idea that they were trying at the very moment to work against. And, um, and that was really ad hoc. You know, I wasn't even thinking that that might happen. But it, was, it had that like, trusted relationship with the core. And so the other examples that I was wondering. Yeah. Yeah. This is a question I think that builds on how you you You're fortunate in this context to have additional uh, freedom that many, particularly government, yeah. directly government managed programs can um, have. We've all been amazed at the sheer quantity of communities with which robust and rich relationships have been maintained. Um, but I, I'd be interested to know if there are cases of winding down relationships. Um, in, uh, not that long ago when Jiffer, Swan, and Jordan talked about this, that museums that have a multicultural interest, they can only maintain ongoing relations so long before this pressure from one <laughs> Oftentimes we speak about this in terms of capacity building, uh -huh. so that we, we want to leave our relationship, we, we hope to leave behind capacities that weren't there before. That's typically the like salve on the wound. But um, are there relationships that have had to wind down because they had gone on long enough? Did yes, they, they, hundreds of them, really. Um, it's hard and it, you know, there. So like I said before, the director, the former director, Deborah Kodish, um, who really built this organization and um, uh, made it possible for us to do the work that we're, that we're doing now um, in so many ways. She, when she transitioned out after 27 years and I became the new director, there were a lot of choices that I had to make. 
about where my expertise were, where my interests were. Um, we really solidified our kind of folk arts and social justice commitment. It was something that Folklore Project had always done, but it wasn't baked into the mission, and it wasn't a requirement for the projects. Um, and there were definitely whispers throughout the community of like, oh, they only work with librarians now. You know, because we were like going so hard for this particular project. We just kept following it and following it. And I, I don't think, at the moment, it felt like a crisis. Was when I heard a couple of people saying, oh yeah, I heard someone saying that they heard someone else saying that Book Book Project only does Liberian stuff now. We don't go to them for grant writing anymore or whatever. It was devastating to me, but ultimately I actually don't think it's um, damaged much now that I have the hindsight view. Um, but yeah, part of the model that I've instituted since I've been there is the Folk Art and Social Change Residency model is that at the end, so it's a four part process of field work, um, planning, some kind of interpretation or presentation, and then finally, evaluation. And in the evaluation phase, it's really about what is next. What are next steps? And so each of these projects launch into something else, and we're not at the center of them. So I have these relationships. I, we're, well, we're, coming, we're circling back to TAP right now, but I haven't really seen these folks in maybe four years now. Um, this, this year is the 10th anniversary of Low Song's um, residency, and so we're hosting a big party for TAP in two weeks from now, and so I'll get to see everyone again, but it's really been so, like very silent since then. Um, and so this next steps question is like, what's going to happen with what we did together? And we're really intentional about what we, what we decide to do. So, um, I'm bad with years now. Um, seven years ago, maybe, we did this great exhibition called We Cannot Keep Silent about, with Asian Americans United, about a 2009 uh, high school boycott in South Philadelphia High School. Um, and we worked with them to do this exhibition about the traditions of organizing in their community and how one generation passes on organizing traditions to the next in the context of this boycott. And when we got to that kind of evaluative phase, we said, what would like, we made this beautiful exhibition. Hundreds of people came to see it. You articulated your stories. They went through that clothesline process and fortified their group. What, what happens now? It's so we want this to be a traveling exhibit. We want to, when we go to youth conferences, we want to take this with us. We want people to learn from our story. And so, um, actually on Facebook this week, they had just set it up at another place. And there, you know, John Kay's post-up stands. It's like, call postupstand.com. I learned about this in grad school. <laughs> and they turned their exhibition into this traveling thing. And so, you know, we're still connected to AAU, but that like intensive working time created a product that's valuable to them. And then, of course, all those materials are in our archive. And so um, that's sort of how we phase things out, this Honoring Ancestors exhibition that um, documented the histories of African dance and drum in Philadelphia. Um, that was, was about 50 people curated this exhibition together. It was a wild experience, and so it was wonderful. And when it ended, and we've been working with these kinds of artists since the very beginning, Deborah started these relationships in 1987. Um, but we really, they've gone dormant recently, especially as we've really connected into the Liberian community. But the exhibition was remounted last year, and so we all gathered up again because another community wanted to put it up. So we just kind of try to keep our keep the next steps and the evaluation as part of the practice rather than it just being over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you just mentioned in a aside, and of course we have all this archive, uh, all this material in our archive. If you could talk a bit more about that, because I was, you know, as I was hearing these things about Proverbs, you know, Liberian proverbs and song. I thought, hmm, I hope they keep a good record. <laughs> uh, we have the Folklore Project Folklife Archive. Um, it has over 80,000 different items in it that are photographs and sound recordings, you know, the mixed media, the way that Folklife Archives often are. Um, and it's kind of we, our gallery is a house, and the first floor of the house is the gallery space, and the second floor of the house is the archive, and our desks are shoved in between the archival holdings, and we actually can't hold anymore. So this year, um, it made the very difficult and very long decisions over these years 
that, um, that we're going to be deaccessioning our archive and giving it to Temple University's Urban Archive. Um, it was a really long process of determining where would be the best place for these materials, um, what are the values of our institution and the value of the other kinds of potential repositories around the city, what might this mean for communities, for access. Um, it was really hard. But the worry is, is that like this winter a squirrel got in and went running all through the archive. Nothing was damaged, but like could have been damaged, or what happens if you know there's a neighbor, you know, it's a twin row house in Philly, what if the, the neighbor's house catches on fire? So um, so <laughs> the so we're gonna be moving it all over to Temple, which will make it much more accessible because when a researcher calls us, frankly, and says, I'd love to look at your blah 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 collection from 1992, everyone's like, okay, who's going to take this one? Like, it's just, it takes up so much time to, to everything's well cataloged and, and put in safe drawers, but just to pull it out and to figure out what the permissions are and to make photocopies and to arrange a time for them to listen to it, and it's just, it's more than we can handle, and we really feel like valuing access over kind of holding it all ourselves. Um, so that's where, if you're interested, you'll be able to find it at Temple soon. I could say, Don, get to the last question. Oh, okay. you like your, uh, well, here's your other choice. Um, we're also meeting at Swiss Yard from 5 o'clock onward, so we invite all of you to join us for a beer or some other organization. You can ask more questions uh, at that time with our guests um, over a beer or whatever you say, because you're poison. And, uh, but I'll let you go ahead and have the last question. Oh, I do have some questions too, especially for those students who are taking, we have two at the record film course at the moment. Oh, cool. And you have some really interesting things to say about the editing process. Oh, and yeah. Continue editing I'd love process. to so, yeah. Don, you got the last question. I don't know, maybe the answer is I do this over here, but I want to know if you'd be able to circle back and talk more about the Liberian Proverbs and Elder Abuse that you had three people touch on before you fast forward it. Um, yeah, I, I don't have too much to say about it. The project didn't focus on elder abuse. Um, there were a number of proverbs that Batu collected in the Don language um, that uh, told him that, that the way people were treating their elders wasn't kind. Um, they weren't respecting them in the traditional way that they should be respected. Um, I, the proverbs are so, you know, Ruth, you might be able to better explain this, but they're, they're, they wouldn't say that to me, for example. Um, that, that, is, that was his interpretation, and that was another hard part of that conversation, was that um, the way that he was translating them and then connecting them to fables, um, it was really unclear to me, just in that, in a very casual conversation that we were having, that, um, even what is abuse, right? Like, how do you answer that question? And that's something we actually investigated very much connected to domestic violence. Um, but it had a lot to do, his worries, like his actual concrete worries were that people were being left home alone, people didn't necessarily have electricity, and they weren't being given the resources to turn the lights on. People didn't understand how to cash a check, and they were giving them to their the younger generation, and those people were cashing the check and not handing the money over those kinds of abuses. But I think on a wider, like, the Proverbs weren't saying, I didn't get my check. The Proverbs were saying, I'm not being respected by my family. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much, Selena.